Hi, I am Maria Drushkova of Natural Mass, interviewing experienced mass circle leaders about their work. In this video, the three leaders talk about their big values in teaching and learning mathematics. So I have a list. I made up a um, basically almost a mission statement for our mass circle last year, and I've been reflecting all year on what the things that we value in our program are, and um, and these are in no particular order, but um, I I want kids to see that math is really rich in its content because most humans, adults included, have this really narrow view of what math is and a lot of people don't even like it. They don't even know that math has such a wide um, range of topics. And um, one, I really want kids to actually learn what math is. I want to disabuse people of the notion that math equals arithmetic, or that math is just problem solving, or that math is actually a performance. Because I think most people think that math is arithmetic, it's problem solving, and it's a performance. And I don't think it's really any of those. I mean, those are small pieces of, of math. Um, I don't know if they have to be or not. Probably the arithmetic does. I don't know, and the problem solving does. I don't know if the performance part really does. But in our country, it is. That's just the reality. What do you call performance? What is it? Um, in the minds of kids, I think it's Oh wow! Um, what what is um 73 plus 12? And um, the first person in the group who says 85 has performed the best. Where there are rewards and recognition for um, getting problems right, doing things in the most efficient way, which um, is not necessarily the most beautiful way, or the most eloquent way, or even the most mathematical way, um, but um, where there's a degree of almost competition and where that there is um, a lot of measurement of the work that people do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so mass is not that. And that's a value. That's a part of your mission statement. Right. Yes. Yeah. So back to the mission statement. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, we want children to experience um, creativity in mathematics. So kind of tied along to that idea of it being a performance and you've got to find the most efficient way to get it done. There's some creativity in that, but if you remove the idea of it being a performance, there's a lot more creativity. There's a gazillion ways to do, to answer almost any question in math. and. Um, People come about it come 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 about exploring it in in many many different um, ways of thinking and even different modalities. So um, I want people to experience that creativity. Um, another big big value for our math circle is that it's collaborative, where people talk out problems in a group, and one person will say put forth a conjecture that might be right or might be wrong, but that'll make the next person think of something. Oh yeah, wait a minute. And then that'll make the next person think of something. And these problems that um, probably nobody could solve on their own. For instance, if we were to do that dark bridge problem with seven-year-olds, which I have done, nobody could do that on their own uh, when they're seven. Um, but if they're all working together and everybody's putting forth different ideas and giving each other ideas and then they have time to sleep on it and reflect too, maybe after six weeks they can um, get the answer. And in my case they did, but then they forgot it and they're still <laughs> talking about it four years later. <laughs> you know, so we can do that one again. But, but um, it was really, it's really, I, I think it's really collaboration that um, is representative of how mathematics is actually done in the real world with professional mathematicians, with people in applied math. People aren't just sitting there 
working in a vacuum. They're throwing out their conjectures to each other. Now everybody's putting them in their blogs. What do you think of this? Uh, mathematicians used to write each other letters. What do you think of this? Um, it's always been collaborative, but now more so. Yeah, and and a lot of people think it's an individual pursuit. So I want to make sure that people get a chance to experience that collaboration and just know that it is a collaborative thing. Um, I want I want kids in my math circle to um, have an opportunity to enjoy math because a lot of kids come to my math circle saying I hate math. Can you help me? <laughs> Basically, what their parents do. But more if the kids, I hate math, but I heard that I might not hate it here. Mm -hmm. um, so I want there to be enjoyment, um, and um, I want kids to um, be able to conceptualize mathematics. Um, mm -hmm beyond um, algorithms. I mean, we don't even, I don't use algorithms at all in the math circle, for instance. Um, they can invent their own if they want. But I want kids to solve problems in a way um, that they end up with a conceptual understanding of it, the mm -hmm. deep down, the deep down structure of why, why something is what it is. Um, and then the, la the last thing that um, I wrote on, on our mission um, statement is to um, educate um, the parents and teachers of these kids too on um, the pedagogy behind what we're doing so that when these kids leave the math circle they can still enjoy math and have success and maybe um, use this way of looking at math outside of math circle too. Mm -hmm. So, that manifesto that you wrote, <laughs> do I you share it with people? I have to write that down. <laughs> okay, what did you say? <laughs> do you share it with people? Do you show it to I people? I haven't yet because I, it really has taken me a long time to come up with this. And um, I just... Um, I sort of fi finalized it in the spring, and I'm hoping to um, get it up on the Talking Stick website. We don't have it up there, up there yet, but I would like to. Mm -hmm. That's my goal to have it up there as the first thing you see if you go onto the website of the Talking Stick Math Circle. Mm -hmm. And do you find you come back to this when you make kind of minute to minute or day to day decisions? Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes there are dilemmas. Do I go this way or that way? Do these principles come up in your decision making? I don't think they do consciously because this list of what's deep is is of what's deep down inside of um, me uh, mm -hmm. and what is a big part of the philosophy of the Talking Stick Learning Center as a whole. It's just it's just how we do things. But I'm sure I'm sure it's hugely influencing every decision. What you're going to get is what I thought about in the last two or three days. Um, I was talking with somebody uh, who did work for the New York City Public Schools, and I wanted her to know. I wanted to establish that we had the same values exactly like this. So what I said to her, and this seemed to have rung a bell, is that um, because I was trying to sh tell her, and she was trying to understand, that, ma that, that outs extracurricular math can be more than homework, help, and test prep. And... Um, what I said to her is that mathematics is, people think mathematics is, not, is about numbers and arithmetic. Uh, it's not about numbers, it's about figuring things out. That's what, pe that's what mathematicians are good at, figuring things out. Uh, and what it means is, well, proving theorems and articulating a, a logical and axiomatic structure. But if you say figuring things out, people understand it a little better. And then you can give... Uh, very simple examples. Any example where somebody says, then obviously, the word obviously is a logical marker. Uh, it's also an emotional marker. It means you figured it out before the other person. But obviously means it ha it's, it's a logical connection. It's not something you have to observe. It's not empirical. So any place where you say obviously, you know, um, 
uh, you can go into the movies if you're over 18 or accompanied by an adult. Obviously, um, if you're both, if you're over 18 and accompanied by your mother, obviously you still can get in. So that's a way of giving the definition, the mathematical definition of um, of or, of um, uh, of disjunction. Um, but people typically say, obviously, in that situation, that if you collect those situations, you'll get some examples. Um, that's my big value. So I don't agree with those people who say that <coughs> the, alg the standard algorithms of arithmetic should be the goal of elementary mathematics. I think the standard algorithms of arithmetic are fine. They're wonderful. Um, they are a means to an end, the end being understanding logical relationships and um, uh, how to figure things out. It's a great mystery of the world why numbers are the place where this happens so frequently. Why we can we figure out things. Why is mathematics associated with numbers if it's really something to be figured out? I don't know. Uh, historically, it wasn't number that this first happened with. It was geometry. So why is geometry the place where you where you practice figuring things out. Why is Euclid so wonderful? Why did Plato write that on the academy? No one, uh, that no one enter here who does not know geometry. I don't know. That's that, that's a very strange thing. Um, but this bears on developing stuff for math circles. Um, sometimes you don't think about mathematics as the pl uh, in the sense of geometry and algebra and arithmetic as the place to find things. Like a clear example is the Giotto games. Um, another example, and this is also a very rich thing in which people can do, mathematical linguistics. Um, there are all these problems now where you figure out things about a language that you don't know. Um, if you Google um, linguistics, puzzles, problems, uh, competitions, there's even an international Olympiad in linguistics, which is very difficult, but um, some of the preparatory stuff really is very rich uh, uh, um, material for um, a math circle. And you see another thing about it is something that would never make it into the regular curriculum. I can't imagine any school district, any um, any body which rules on curriculum saying you should have a everybody in uh, ninth grade from March to May should study mathematical linguistics. It's not going to happen. And yet there's all kinds of things in there that don't look like mathematics, but uh, from my point of view are pure mathematics. Uh, so that's another place to look for, uh, for stuff. And the moral of the story there is um, look outside the traditional um, algebra, arithmetic, geometry, for places where kids figure things out. Um, I would love to know more things about, I'm very bad at sports, I don't follow any sports at all. Uh, I would love to find places, because so many kids are interested in it, where that happens. I don't just mean statistics, I don't just mean batting averages, I mean places where people have to figure out things that involve uh, physical activity. I don't know. Again, a hypothesis, not something I'm suggesting is a good pl a good thing to do. Maybe it's not possible. Uh, can I recall an anecdote or example from my circle where you made a decision based on what I value? Oh, God. There's too many of them because the values are so integrated into the teaching. I'm drawing a blank, Maria. I can't. <laughs> well, okay. Here's, here's, here's a typical example. This is not just one anecdote. This happens over and over. But um, when you're teaching NIM, for, all right, the first one I always use is 12 beans. The person who takes the last bean is a loser. Um, you can, you must take one, you can take as many as five. It's just one example that I use all, all the time. Um, very typically, the kids start focusing not on the position of the game, not on how many beans are left, but how many beans they've taken. So, 
so it becomes this like superstition. If I take an even number, I win. If I take two at the beginning, I win. Now, the problem is that for that particular little example, you can say it that way. If you take five at the beginning, you're going to win. Um, so I have to break down that superstition. So I play with them, and I make them follow their strategy. They have to take an even number. And they quickly see it's not going to work. And the part that, the hint I give, they say, do you want, I say, do you want a hint? And of course they want a hint. And the only hint I give them is don't concentrate on how many you're taking, concentrate on how many are left. And they typically understand that after being burnt once. Um, and uh, so that that's a kind of thing where, the, it, it, am I answering your question? I'm not sure I am. But the value is not how to win the game. All right, so to translate that into more mathematical things, if I'm teaching, the value is not do they learn to invert and multiply in dealing with fractions, in, in, in dividing fractions. No. What I, the, what I want to figure, them to figure out is um, when you're dividing by half, it's the same as multiplying by two. Um, because there are twice as many halves in a quantity than there are twos in a quantity, than, than, than the quantity. Um, and dividing by 1 23rd is the same as multiplying by 23. And then dividing by 19 23rds, you get to that, is the same as multiplying by 23 and dividing by 19. I want them to see that step by step. I don't want them to see a mechanical procedure. So in NIM, I don't want to see the mechanical procedure. Take five and you'll win. I want them to see why it works so that when they have 15 means instead of 12, they still don't take five and they'll lose. They'll figure out how many to take at the beginning. Okay, so that's not really a, um, an anecdote, but it's, it's, it gives a window, I think. So the value is not for them to know the NIM algorithm, but to reason to figure things out exactly. That's exactly right. When something is an algorithm, it's already embalmed. It's, it's something to look at, not something to do. And if you do it, the, the way to use algorithms, in my view, is in order to get further to get to the, to get to the frontier of where you don't have an algorithm. Um, so I think that, like I said, t um, cultivating intellectual curiosity, both in yourself and in the students, um, striving to build a community of learners that enjoy discussing things together, um, mm -hmm. enjoying the beauty and audacity of mathematical ideas and the camaraderie of other uh, camaraderie of other mathematicians. Um, it's important, um, and then striving to overcome egocentric tendencies that get in the way of mathematical exploration, both in yourself and your students. That's challenging. Um, <laughs> and then cultivating the habit of asking dumb and smart questions. So dumb questions are really important. Dumb questions are the ones where you're like, I should know this, but what does that mean? I don't remember, blah, blah, blah. Or, um, you know, you have to start with the dumb questions, because otherwise you're just sitting there wishing you knew. Um, more about whatever it is. And, and if that's the thing about being a mathematician, and especially leading math circles, you're guaranteed to get into territory that you have known nothing about and have never learned. And so you're like, I, I need to learn, I need to take five more courses to learn this. Um, that's awesome, right? So you have to be willing to be in the habit of putting yourself in the position of not knowing things and being willing to ask the dumb questions. And then um, getting to the point where you can ask the smart questions, which are um, like, how could we shape this area of um, mathematical exploration with some questions that are really fascinating and that come at it from a unique angle. Those are the smart questions to ask, um, but, uh, but they're not easy either. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, the set of values. Can, can you make an example or two, just small things that happen where it comes up some of these things you named audacity or egocentric trick ten yeah. uh, egocentric tendencies <laughs> or or the questioning and curiosity can can you make a couple of little exa pra practical mm -hmm. examples of how you stir people that way so so the egocentric tendencies I'll start there is a um it's there's a 
tendency, like I said, to sort of rest on what you know or to, to sort of bluff your way or, you know, um, there's a lot of bluff and bluster in mathematics and some of that is good, but some of it gets in the way of learning things because um, you aren't willing to admit you don't know things and really um, get in a little deeper. And the students do this to themselves too. They'll want to sort of swagger around and pretend that they know things or or just come out with statements to impress the other students or to impress you. Um, and that gets in the way of having a genuine mathematical conversation where we're appreciating each other's um, um, input. This is especially important with little kids because little kids barely know there are other people in the room um, other than the instructor and them. And <laughs> getting them to notice that the other ones have some good ideas is a challenge as well. So what do you do? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it depends on what's going on at the moment. But try just trying, to, well, um, if there are overt um, instances of ego getting in the way, I try to directly quash that um, as quickly as possible. But um, in other cases, we sort of ride it out and help them just try to give them more and more understanding of the value of other people's thinking and the value of um, being open to learning new things, that kind of thing. So how about how about uh, questions and uh, how about audacity? Can you make an example mm. of someone doing some something brave, audacious? <laughs> In mathematic, um, with mathematical ideas. Um, In your circles. Yeah. Um, just. Um, well, usually you can tell because they start it by, "There's no way this could work," or "This is completely crazy," but. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, so that's they know. Not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but usually they think it's crazy in a bad way, and they're just working up the courage to like, okay, I, I want to put this out there anyway. Um, what and, do you uh, do then? Usually those are it's like, okay, well let's 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 try this, and sometimes those uh, audacious ideas are really interesting and lead somewhere, and sometimes they sometimes they don't go anywhere at all. So um, I don't know. I think just. Um, I think I'm trying to think of uh, some specific topics where this happened. Um, I think um, there are some examples with our um, Upanas circle. We were studying theories about how Upanas worked in Incan culture mm -hmm. with this circle, and they um, came up with some just crazy theories of their own. And then wanted to try to persuade the other students that this is how it might have worked, um, and that was really, that was pretty wild. Um, in a way, we have the audacious, audacious ideas coming up now. This idea of trying to do mathematics with banana splits and so forth. Those are that's more just a wild idea, but um, it might, uh, it may become audacious as we dig deeper. The thing about a really audacious idea, it's something like you know Cantor's diagonalization argument, or something like where you're just like. Whoa, you know how could, um, you know, how how could anyone think that way, right? Um, so so it, it has that range. So you support the wild wild idea, and you are sort of responsible for helping kids dig deeper. So it mm -hmm. doesn't just stay. So they don't just throw things out to to hear their own voice and to do right. wild things. Right. So they get it to where it's something like the Cantor's, uh, uh, the Cantor's prove um, that uh, there are um, uh, more that irrational, irrational numbers, numbers. Than, than rational numbers. Uh, right. So uh, which so is another, which is something the kids just love, by the way. That pr argument in particular, that whole idea of thinking about the sizes of infinities. Students love that. In the next video in the series, the three leaders will share their thoughts about other people's mass circles.